Today is Pie Day, 3.14, and to mark this occasion, I'm going to make this delicious apple pie. I'm planning to make an American apple pie because it's actually American Pie Day, 3.14, March 14th, because the standard date format for the USA is month, day, year. We have a little while to wait here in the UK because our date format is day, month, year, so British Pie Day doesn't come around until the 3rd of December. Anyway, the inspiration for this video came from this pie dish that I picked up in a charity shop for a pound. It has a recipe for American apple pie printed under the glaze. Except, wait a minute, this is fake. This isn't an American pie dish at all. Over analysis time again, here are just a few things I spotted. Firstly, the ingredients are all weighed. That's not standard for an American recipe. And it gives the measurements in metric and imperial. Whilst the US customary system of weights and measures is based on the imperial system, I don't think it's often called imperial over there. Anyway, to go on, the recipe specifies cooking apples, which I don't think are all that common in the USA. I think I'm right in saying that an American apple pie would normally just use a dessert variety of apple. Also, it mentions corn flour, which would be cornstarch. And the baking instructions include a gas mark setting, which is only a thing in the UK and some Commonwealth and former Commonwealth nations. And those are just the things I noticed. Did you spot anything I missed? Perhaps most obviously, if this was an American apple pie dish, I think it would probably just say apple pie without needing to specify American. Indeed, such things as genuine American pie dishes printed with authentic original American apple pie recipes do exist. It's just that this one seems to be a British knockoff with a British adaptation of a notionally American apple pie recipe on it. I'm going to use this dish and I'm going to make a transatlantic, multinational, international apple pie. We're just, we're just going to make apple pie. It's going to be fairly similar to this, but I'm not going to follow these instructions exactly because reasons. One more thing about recipe dishes like this. Are you supposed to commit the recipe to memory or transcribe it onto paper? Or, I suppose nowadays, take a photo on your smartphone? Because if you try to follow the instructions straight from the dish, you only get halfway through them, the point where you put the bottom crust in place, and you can't see the instructions anymore. Anyway, with those thoughts all thunk, let's head off to the kitchen and make an apple pie. Okay, well the first thing to do is get that label off. Give us a thorough wash. Now I do get a lot of questions about why we use a plastic bowl inside a metal sink in the UK here. Uh, there's probably a bunch of reasons for that. One of them is if you drop something, plastic's just a little bit more forgiving than metal. But also, when you've only got a single sink like this, it enables you to tip things like coffee dregs and whatnot down the side there without contaminating the washing up water. OK, I'll leave that to drain, dry it, and then we'll make the pie. One rather disappointing feature of this dish is it doesn't even have the recipe for the pastry on here. It just assumes you're going to start with short crust pastry. So let's do that anyway. Now, for an apple pie, I like a short crust pastry on the bottom, and I like a more flaky texture on the top. So I'm going to make two different kinds of pastry today, but only from one mix. So we'll start off with 250 grams of plain flour. And because this is a sweet pastry, I'm just going to put about a tablespoonful of caster sugar in there. Next, 150 grams of salted butter. If I was using unsalted, I might put a pinch of salt in with the flour, but this is salted. So helpfully marked in 50 gram increments on the wrapper. Let's see how accurate those are. So 50, 100, 150 should be about there. 151 grams. Wow. It's much more accurate than I actually thought it would be. Butter is actually just going to come out of there for a moment because I need to cut that up into little cubes. I will just dust it with the flour just to make that a bit more pleasant a process. Little chunks because the top of this crust is going to be a rough puff pastry and the bottom is going to be a kind of a short crust but it's actually going to be made from the rough puff but we're going to blend the flour and fat a bit more thoroughly in half of this pastry, which will give it a, a slightly more resilient crust. And for the bottom crust of an apple pie, you kind of want the pastry to be a little bit tougher. And I'll just toss those in the flour just to make sure that they're all separate and don't stick together. And then I'm just going to add enough cold water to bring this together into a dough, just, just so it comes together. It's going to be a quarter of a cup of water at the most, probably more like few tablespoons so even though that still looks like a very ragged pile of stuff that will come together into a dough okay so that mixture which is barely a mixture 
comes out onto there. Now I'm just going to pull it all together. Okay, you notice I'm not going to kneading it exactly, I'm just pushing it together. A little bit of flour on the pastry, on the board, and a bit on the rolling pin as well. I'm just going to roll that out. And you see those big chunks of butter in there? Okay, so now we're going to fold. So we go into the middle, both ends into the middle like that. Turn and roll again. So that was the first fold. Now in a recent video I did say just do this until it looks right. But it turns out I'm kind of doing the seven folds that, that everybody considers standard. So that was so this is the second fold, and we can still see great big chunks of butter. And every fold like this, because we're folding and turning, is bringing all these ragged edges into the middle. So this is the third fold. Little bits like that, you can just throw them in the middle. And as we work this, this butter's getting kind of smeared out into laminated layers inside the dough. So this is the fourth fold. This is the fifth fold. This is the sixth fold. And this is the seventh fold. And pretty much that is a ready to use rough puff pastry now. So now what I'm gonna do is roll it out just a little bit like that. I'm going to wrap that and put it in the fridge because it just needs to relax a little bit. Apples, I'm going to be using Brayburn. I've got some very nice big Brayburn apples here. They're not normally not as big as this actually, but the bag does say Brayburn. Not all of the apple varieties that you will find in American recipes are available in the UK. Never seen Honeycrisp here, for example. So I've just got my big bowl here with a little bit of water in it. I'm going to squeeze some lemon juice in that, which will stop the apple slices from browning as I prepare them. And then we'll just, we'll just take out the cores of the apples like that and peel them. It's supposed to be good luck if you can peel an apple entirely in one piece. Maybe it's more a case of skill, and maybe good luck happens to skillful people more often. Well, I didn't get there this time, so nicely peeled. I think some people do leave the skins on for apple pie, but I find they go tough when they're cooked. You can see this is starting to brown already, so I'm gonna be quick here and stop wittering. Cutting those into little wedges, about half a centimeter, and then straight into the acidified water. I'll give those a little jig around just to make sure they're properly coated. In the intro, I mentioned cooking apples. Now, if you've never encountered cooking apples before, the UK has quite a lot of varieties of cooking apple. Bramley is probably the most famous, but there are a great many more. And cooking apples tend to be a lot bigger than eating apples or dessert apples. They tend to be a lot more tart they are sufficiently sour that most people probably wouldn't want to eat them directly just as an apple out of hand. Although exceptions exist, of course, some people like sour things. And often they have specific cooking qualities. Some other apples stay really quite firm when they're cooked. And so cooking apples, it's a combination of size, specific flavors as well. Bramley has a particularly apple pie aroma at least it does in the UK, because that's what we're accustomed to having in our apple pies. Anyway, as I say, I'm using this variety here today, which is labelled Brayburn, but I'm starting to doubt that, because I tasted a bit of this, and it seems a bit softer and sweeter than your typical Brayburn. Five apples might be enough. And the way to test, and the way to find out, is going to be to offer it up. So I will just figure out... Yeah, I think even when we got the pastry in there, I think we could stand to have another apple. So one more it is, and I've got a fairly small one here. 
I'd say that's more of a typical Braeburn apple. I think sometimes with supermarket varieties, you get them labelled. They're supposed to be labelled with the variety. But I think sometimes in supermarkets, you get them labelled with the kind of uh, ancestral variety. So very often you'll see apples labelled Cox, and they're probably not Cox's orange pippin. They're probably a Cox descendant, because some of the modern Cox descendants have very similar looking fruits, very similar eating qualities, but then they might have better disease resistance or some other thing that makes them better as a commercial tree. So sometimes when you see a variety, and in this case Braeburn, it might be that these are not actually Braeburn apples, they are Braeburn type apples. I don't think that's necessarily deceptive. I think that's just probably, if you're trying to describe something as the type of thing it is, rather than the exact thing it is, especially if the exact thing is not something anybody would know. So that's six apples in there. And I'll give them another little toss just to get the lemon juice and water on them. So one more time, I'm gonna offer up these apples into the dish, but this time I've got my scales underneath because I need to weigh the apples so I can calculate the sugar. The sugar is gonna be basically 20% of the weight of the apples. 887 grams of apples, write that down. Now I did say 20% of the weight of apples in sugar, but these are dessert apples. So I'm gonna go a little bit under. 20% of 887 grams of apples would be 177. I'm going to go for 150. A tablespoonful or thereabouts of corn flour, corn starch. And this will cling to the apples and it will turn all of the juice that comes out of the apples into a kind of a sauce. Ground cinnamon. Well, about a heaped teaspoonful. This is not a teaspoon, but I'm kind of eyeballing it. I like a bit of cinnamon, so we'll go for, that's probably about a teaspoon and a half of cinnamon. And normally nutmeg, but I have this ground mace to use up, and ground, and mace is a very similar spice, it's from the same plant. So about, about a teaspoonful of ground mace, or as I say, nutmeg. And ground ginger, just only about half a teaspoonful. And just bring those all together. Just break up any clumps of sugar and the crucial thing here is getting the cornstarch or the corn flour distributed into the sugar because we really don't want that in lumps in the pie. Okay, I'm going to set that aside now while I sort out the pastry. This pastry has been in the fridge for about half an hour while I've been chopping apples and wittering at the camera. And we're going to find now that hopefully this is a lot more relaxed. Now, a little over half of this dough, maybe about that much, so a little bit more than half, We'll set that aside, that's going to be the bottom crust in a minute. This piece here I'm going to roll out into something like a circle, big enough to go over the top of the pie. This is our flaky top crust. So just going to roll in all directions until we get something that's a, a big enough piece to cut a circle out of. Okay, I think that might be big enough. Pie dish. And I'm just going to trim off with a little bit of leeway for extra trimming. I'm just going to trim off some scraps of pastry there and then that can go back together with the rest of the dough which is going to make the base. So that's the top crust, lots of flour and then I'll roll that up and again that can get wrapped and just set to one side for a moment. The rest of this pastry I'm going to make into something a bit more like a short crust. And that's going to happen just by putting it in here. I'll probably break it up. And you see how that dough kind of broke apart and then came back together. Now what we've done now is broken up all of that butter and homogenized it a bit more with the flour. This is around about the time when I'm preheating my oven. I'm just going to set that pastry to one side for a moment and prepare the dish. Smear it liberally with butter. You could use a cooking spray, that would be a lot easier than what I'm doing here. Or you could just use oil and brush it on. Oil tends to just to kind of bead up a little bit though. So what you probably want to do if you do use oil is then dust it with flour or semolina or something like that to hold the oil in place. Right, that is enough butter. Basically enough butter that you can see it. 
And so this is going to roll out thinner than the other dough did, but that's fine because the bottom crust of this pie is not going to cook as crisp as the top. And so the pastry just needs to be a little bit thinner or else it'll just be a soggy, horrible bit of dumpling. Nice dusting of flour to stop it sticking. Up onto the rolling pin and then back across the pie. And then to get that to fall into the pie, I'm just going to lift up the edges. I'm not going to stretch it down. Just lift it up and let it fall down there. A bit of a shortage over this side and a bit of an excess over this side. This bit's going to be kind of hidden away anyway, so we can do a quick repair job here. A bit of water on a scrap of pastry and just attach it on like that. And just so I don't mess that up, we're going to trim it off now. That little bit there, not going to waste that. We'll think of something to do with that. We could make a couple of little jam tarts, or we could make some decoration for the top crust. I'm going to put that back in the fridge while I just sort out the apples. I've thoroughly drained the apples, so drained off all that water and lemon juice. There is still a bit of liquid adhering to the apple slices, and that's fine. Now my sugar and spice and corn flour mix, I'll just put some of that in there and get it coating the pieces. Then the rest. Right, that's good. Now the exciting moment of assembly. My lined pie dish. And I think hands are probably the best way to do this. I might have made too much filling, but that's probably better than not enough. But I'm kind of pushing it down, not to leave any voids between slices. And if necessary, that means we'll break up a few little pieces as we go. Just kind of pushing them down, snapping them into place, just to make sure that there is no unfortunate void in there. And we're not going to waste that bit of sugar and apple juice that's in there. Now it's time for a little bit more butter. And this is going to go on in thin little slivers like that, just to distribute it around. 25 to 30 grams of extra butter in here. That will cook down together with the apples and the corn flour and the sugar and the apple juice and the spices, hopefully to make a kind of almost like butterscotch sauce. That seems like it might be enough butter. And now my pie lid, which I rolled out earlier, just need to be a little bit careful about how this goes on. This goes into place and I'll just make sure it's all lined up. It's good. I think just to make sure that that sticks down, just go in there with a bit of water all the way around. So I'll press that down all the way around first, just to seal it. Then we do another little trim to get it nice and tidy. Nice and neat. And again, we're not gonna waste that. And now the crimp, just thumbs like that. I'm just going to go all the way around and make a nice neat crimp all the way around the edge. Now you could use a fork and press that down and that would help to bind the crust. I quite like a pie crimp. There we go. So nice neat crimp all the way around the outside. So my leftover scraps of dough, I just need that back together into a little ball. So this is going to be more like a short crust pastry than a puff pastry. So this will provide a little bit of kind of contrast on the top crust, which is mostly rough puff, but this will be short. And then really whatever you like with this. So I think what I'm gonna do, I'll cut three little circles. And maybe four little circles. And then kind of leaf shapes. These circles are actually going to be apples. Now I know it's pie day, uh, I probably should put the Greek letter pi on here. But did you know the Greek letter pi is not actually pi, it's P. Same as our letter P. So really this should be P day. Well, something like that. I don't think that's necessarily my finest pie decoration, but it'll do. Egg wash time. And for some reason we've got white eggs today. Eggs in the UK are more commonly brown. 
but we've got all kinds of weird shortages going on right now. Egg wash on the top. The recipe dish said brush with milk, but I think egg wash will give us a much nicer result. All right, I think we're nearly there. We'll cut some little steam vents in here, like so. Just a little bit of demerara sugar, which is coarse brown sugar, which will now, of course, stick to the egg wash. That's to now go into the oven, our gas mark five on my oven, and it's gonna cook until it's nice and crispy and golden. All right, so that's at half an hour in the oven now, and I'm not very sure, the top crust looks amazing, I'm not very sure the pie is gonna be cooked at the bottom. So, I'm just gonna get in there with the temperature probe and see what the bottom temperature is. The bottom crust is always gonna be a little bit soggy in an apple pie, unless you blind bake it. But if you blind bake it, then you're gonna have trouble crimping the edges onto it. So the bottom crust temperature is 60, about 64, 65 degrees Celsius. So not quite hot enough. Unfortunately, my decorative apples and things are all a bit lost in here anyway, but it does look nice, doesn't it? What I'm gonna to do to stop that top crust from burning, I'm gonna tent this with foil. Just loosely tent it like that and we'll make a little steam vent just there. And that will stop that from toasting any further while the bottom of the pie still cooks. Right, that's now had a total of 40 minutes and I'm pretty sure that's done all the way through. You can just see when you give it a push there, that's all of the juicy apple and butter filling bubbling up. I'm gonna leave this to stand now for probably at least half an hour before I try to cut and serve it. Right, that's had probably nearly an hour cooling actually because I didn't want it to be fruity napalm. Listen to that crust. I don't know if this is gonna come out in one piece. We will see. Might be lucky, let's have a go. Let's get in there. No, <laughs> the first piece has really rather fallen apart. But I'm fairly sure that's still gonna be a delicious slice of pie. Now normally on apple pie, I would go for some hot custard. But I thought today we might just have a bit of ice cream. I've got some creme brulee ice cream here. Okay, let's try this pie. Just have a go at this pie on its own first, I think. Mm. That is a very fine pie. I think the thing that really makes this is the butter on top of those apples. And if we just have a look at that pastry, can you see the, the kind of lamination in there? Of that rough puff pastry. So good. And the apples have cooked to a point where they're tender and that corn flour in there has created a kind of yeah almost like toffee sauce so so good so happy american pie day that is an amazing pie let me know in the comments how american apple pie you think that is and maybe what you would do differently thanks for watching and i hope to see you again soon